All right, welcome back. This is the last part of these rather long lectures about heat. In fact, this is going to bring us to the end of the first module of the course. And remember, this second lecture of heat was really about just two things. The business of how much short wave down we're receiving from uh, at the surface of the Earth, and also how much long wave down that we are receiving from the sky. And so the only thing we have left now is to talk about long wave radiation coming down from the sky. And as you remember from the first part of this lecture, that is what comes uh, from the greenhouse gases in clouds in the Earth's atmosphere. The greenhouse gases like carbon dioxide and methane and water vapor and also clouds uh, emit a lot of long wave radiation, admittedly some of it up towards the outer space and that is energy that is gone, but a lot of it is back down towards the ground in the form of long wave radiation that reaches the ground and warms the ground up, long wave down. That is called the greenhouse effect, and in fact, the, it is the maintenance of the Earth's temperature through the action of carbon dioxide, water vapor, and other greenhouse gas glasses and clouds, and these are the gases that are necessary to maintain the temperature of the Earth. The greenhouse effect is a perfectly natural part of the Earth's climate system. In fact, without it, Earth would be much too cold to support life. Uh, the entire Earth would be a frozen ball of ice if because we're just simply too far from Earth's yellow sun in order to uh, receive enough radiation for there to be liquid water. But, we so by having greenhouse gases in the Earth's atmosphere, we are able to maintain our planet in a range of temperatures that are appropriate for living things as we know them. That's the greenhouse effect. It is necessary. To, it was what, when the term greenhouse effect was coined more than 100 years ago, they were thinking of this idea that, like, it's a glass hothouse that helps keep the Earth, just like a snugly warm greenhouse keeps your roses safe during the winter. That's lovely. That's lovely. It's kind of, it doesn't work anything the way a greenhouse does and so on, as survivors of ATS and EVS 105 would know. But, um... But the basic idea that it's, you know, keeping the Earth appropriate for living things is a good idea. On the other hand, we keep adding more greenhouse gases to the Earth's atmosphere, creating the so-called enhanced greenhouse effect. Now, the enhanced greenhouse effect is apparently associated with climate change. Now, I know that a large portion of the students who take this class also have taken 105, a whole course about climate change, and you've seen the evidence, and you know what is good and what is bad about the evidence, and what we know, and how it does appear that this is the case, that we are, in fact, what is responsible for climate change. We know that we are adding greenhouse gases to the atmosphere, in particular carbon dioxide, but also methane and so on, by literally the gigaton, as in billions of tons. Um, this is an enormous amount of carbon dioxide and also methane and so on that we add to the Earth's atmosphere every year, and we know the physics are solid. We know what, that these greenhouse gas that these gases enhance the greenhouse effect, and we know from observations that our planet is getting warmer. Um, you know, like for example, these are just a plot that shows what uh, the temperatures around the Earth were in the first half of 2016, and you can see that most areas on Earth, in fact, basically all areas on land are above normal temperatures at this time, and in fact, that darkest shade of red is warmest on record, and you can see that there's an awful lot of that dark red all over the globe and so on. There are a few places over uh, the oceans where the temperatures are below normal, but that is more about like changes in ocean currents due to melting ice and so on. That's not necessarily good news that there's a few places that are cooler. So we know that the planet is getting warmer, and we have other records that show that in fact this is part of a trend really for the last 120 years or so that the planet has been getting warmer and warmer and the planet is currently sitting at about oh about a little over a degree degree point two 1.2 degrees something like that above its long-term average of temperature that's in celsius um this is not good i mean these are facts these are again if you took the 105 class you actually learned more about the observing systems and how we keep maintain the quality of this data and so on but this is hard to argue with. This looks like ever, this looks like the planet is definitely getting warmer. We certainly know that sea ice is melting. Uh, this shows, for example, the the record of sea ice. Now um, that shaded in area shows over the course of the year. We normally, of course, would expect that from February, March through June, and so on, there would be less ice up in the Arctic, and so on. That makes perfectly good sense. But like the blue curve is what's been happening in 2016, and you can see that it is well outside of the normal range of how much melting happens, and so on. That's all very bad, and that all comes from observations. Is that proof that the planet is warming due to the increased number of amount of greenhouse gases in the Earth's atmosphere? 
Strictly speaking, no. Again, if you took the 105 class, you actually learned why that's not proof. And that, that is evidence, but it is not proof, and so on. Um, that There could be, for example, natural processes that are canceling out what the humans are doing by adding greenhouse gases, and then some natural process is also causing the planetary warming. That's entirely possible, okay? Not very likely, as we saw in that other course, uh, but it's possible. Um, we have other kinds of evidence. For example, we know the physics of the atmosphere. That's a lot of what you're going to be learning in this course. And we can take the basic rules that govern how the atmosphere works and create computer simulations of the climate that are called models. We'll learn later in the course a great deal more about how models work. And these models can simulate how the climate changes as we add more carbon dioxide and other greenhouse gases to the Earth's atmosphere. And if we do that, we find that the planet's temperature to date should have warmed by about one degree, maybe a little bit more, one degree Celsius or a little bit more. And that's, in fact, almost exactly what has been observed. So we can say, hey, we can take the physics of the atmosphere, we understand how the atmosphere works, let's simulate how the planet's temperature should have changed, and we get almost exactly what the planet has changed. That sounds really good too. Strictly speaking, is that proof? Well, strangely, no. Um, you know, all of that would be contingent on the idea that we understand the physics of greenhouse gases and the response of the atmosphere to greenhouse gases and the rates at which ice would melt and so on. That all requires that we understand that correctly. And it could just be a coincidence. It could just be a coincidence that we misunderstood and have the physics of it wrong, but we get the right answer anyway. Okay, that, that can happen. I mean, scientists have to be aware of that type of error that they can make and so on. But that is one heck of a smoking gun. Okay, um, that certainly does seem to be very strong evidence that we are causing it. The likelihood that our understanding of the physics of climate is that wrong and just happens to be wrong exactly as much as the change of climate has been is just extremely small. I mean, the reality is science works. We live in a world that was built by science, and science doesn't make that kind of mistake very often. The science has lots of safeguards about preventing those kinds of mistakes. Uh, the scientific method works. And to be honest, it kind of doesn't matter whether we have the answer right or not. This is the best answer we're going to get. Okay, uh, All of the ideas, the, the George W. Bush administration was famous for wanting to say on the, on the subject of climate change, when the scientists can prove to us that this is what's happening, we'll be glad to take action on it. Well, guess what? If this doesn't count as proof, we're not going to get anything better than that. Uh, this is the best answer we're going to get. This is the answer we have to work with. And the scientific community, and to a you know, and the public at large and uh, international governments and so on around the world pretty much understand that this is the answer, that by and large, we are getting more long wave radiation down from the sky and keeping the planet warmer due to all these greenhouse gases that we're putting in the Earth's atmosphere. And we really need to address that. We need a treaty that helps us un take control of the situation. Remember back when we were talking about ozone depletion and the ozone hole and how we came up with a new treaty, the Montreal Protocol, back in the mid-80s or so, that was about phasing out the chlorofluorocarbons and so on that were causing the problems. And here it is like 20 years later, and the truth of the matter is the ozone hole is still a problem, but it is a smaller problem than it used to be. And the ozone hole is recovering, and we the ozone layer is recovering, and we're going to... we kind of save the world. Well, let's make a treaty that saves the world from global warming and the greenhouse, enhanced greenhouse effect. Well, back in the 90s and early 2000s, a treaty was hammered out that can uh, that addresses that, and it's called the Kyoto Protocol. You've probably heard that term before. It's named after Kyoto, Japan, the place where it was ultimately signed. And we're going to talk for a little while about how this Kyoto Protocol was designed and what it was, what it was supposed to do to address the problems of global warming. I tried to create a framework in which the nations of the world were discouraged from using fossil fuels. And, well, again, people who've taken ATS 105 and so on have seen there's actually lots of different ways you could encourage countries to do it. And in practice, the Kyoto Protocol was a market-based approach. It was trying to create ways in which there were economic incentives to, uh, to make this all work. The Kyoto Protocol was actually signed by the most of the governments of the world in 1995, uh, 1997, and it went into full force by 2005. Um, the countries that signed it uh, and ratified it are supposed to already be 
taking these actions and so on. Now, it's a little complicated to sort out exactly how the Kyoto Protocol works. Uh, it has a lot of rules and it has a lot of definitions and it's, it's open to interpretation as treaties and so on often are. Let me give you an explanation of how it works. Basically, what the Kyoto Protocol did is it established a couple of lists of all the countries of the world. These three lists kind of form the very basic understanding of what is going on in the Kyoto Protocol. Now, they didn't use the words, the kind of judgmental words that I used here, but they'll help you understand. They call it list A, list B, and list C, or list 1, 2, and 3, or something unimportant like that. Basically, one list was the so-called developed nations. This would be a term that maybe we used to call first world nations or something like that. They were places like the United States and Japan, most of the countries of Western Europe, and so on. These are very big polluters with big active economies, lots of cars, lots of consumption of electricity, and so on. And frankly, they make up a fairly small fraction of the world's population. There were also a list of so-called developing countries. Countries whose economies were changing rapidly at the time that the treaty was being negotiated in the 1990s. Places like China and Indonesia and India. Places that, you know, had been starving children a generation before and now were building iPhones. Okay, well, they weren't making iPhones in 1997, but you know what I'm saying. The, the, the economies were rapidly changing. These have very, very high populations in these countries and they were becoming increasingly industrial. These places were rapidly consuming more and more electricity, car ownership was up, electrical consumption was up, and so on. And they have very, very large populations. So this is kind of a ticking time bomb with those countries. And finally, there was a list of countries, again, they didn't use the word undeveloped countries, just list C or something like that. But these are countries that are currently not really using all that much fossil fuels at all because they don't really have all that much of an economy going on. Now, no matter what countries I list on this list, somebody always has objections. Oh my goodness, no, I've been to Uruguay and it was beautiful and I stayed at a four-star hotel. Yeah, that's lovely. Okay, overall, the total economic activity of Uruguay, Ivory Coast, Congo, Angola, you know, name any number of these undeveloped countries and you realize these are places where they're not really consuming very much fossil fuels per capita. Now, what the hope was for the Kyoto Protocol was that we could somehow find a way to reduce the total amount of carbon dioxide that's being emitted by the burning of all these fossil fuels worldwide. And we wanted to find a way, when this was being negotiated back in the 1990s, we wanted to find a way to do this that allowed developing countries to continue to develop. I mean, it's not random that China, India, and Indonesia, and a few other such places, were rapidly changing their economies. They did it because of certain choices they made as a society about things like education, and the values of things like thrift, and rights of women, and so on. Um, there's a reason why China and India were developing, and Pakistan, Afghanistan, I, you know, these places were not. And we, they made the right choices. We don't want to cut out Cut and say, sorry, China, we're going to change the rules now on you. No, China was developing because they made certain smart choices. Same with Indonesia, same with India. We have to find a way to protect that. They made the choices we wanted them to make. Now they need to have their economic development. Let's face it, who's going to pay for this? It's going to have to be the developed world, but that doesn't mean that the developed world is just flush with cash. We want to do this in a way that is going to be at the least cost to the developed world. And we want to find a way to compensate those countries that aren't emitting a lot of carbon dioxide, those undeveloped countries. Um, I mean, that doesn't mean we don't want them to develop or anything like that, but we want them to develop economies in ways that don't involve that step of having lots of coal-fired power plants and every a car in every garage. There has to be a way to develop those countries that doesn't involve that. So basically what the Kyoto Protocol said is, hey, you develop countries, United States, Japan, Western Europe, etc., you need to reduce your carbon emissions by about 7%. Each country on that list got, had its own quota, but 7% is a good estimate here. And if you don't cut your carbon dioxide emissions by that much, there's going to be some economic penalties. Um, and those penalties are huge. Okay, so if you're on that list, Germany, okay, guess what? You've got to find ways to reduce your carbon dioxide emissions by 7%. 7% is not an unreachable goal. 7% is something that, you know, by smart economic policies, uh, 
for example, no, the United States is not a participant in the Kyoto Protocol, but you might remember oh, about eight years ago there was the Cash for Clunkers program where they got a lot of old cars off that were very bad about uh, burning, uh, you know, they had poor gas mileage. They got them off the road and, re you know, gave you money to replace them with better, more efficient cars. Places like Germany, Belgium, England, uh, France, these places all had similar programs. The United States didn't invent Cash for Clunkers. In the same way, there could be economic incentives to clean up power plants or to build new, uh, to, you know, demonstration technologies, wind power, and things like that. The undeveloped countries also got, this is the places like, you know, Senegal, Egypt, Ivory Coast, Nicaragua. These undeveloped countries also had limits set as to how much carbon dioxide they could burn and uh, emit. In other words, basically how much fossil fuels they could burn. But those limits were actually kind of high. They were actually higher than what they really were burning. So, you know, there would be, you know, like, let's say at the present time, Nicaragua emits one gigaton of carbon. No, that wouldn't be that much. Um, a million tons of carbon dioxide per year. Okay, that's a horrible thing. But, um, but they actually have permission to burn two million tons uh, or emit two million tons a year. Why? Because those countries can sell their permission to burn that extra piece. Now, this is an interesting little market thing. I'll show you in a couple slides how that's going to work. The developed, the developing rather countries, China, India, Indonesia, who were rapidly changing, were largely unaffected by the Kyoto Protocol. There were some minor things they had to do, but basically develop your economy however you want. If you want to build coal fire power plants in China, go and do it. There also was what we're going to do with all this money that the penalty scheme was going to create, because at least at first, there was no way France and Switzerland and Italy and Canada and so on, the developed countries were going to meet their goals, at least not at first. And so they were going to be paying penalties. What are we going to do with all that? The idea was that the money from the penalties would be used to compensate the poor countries uh, for the effects of global warming, like increased uh, droughts and kind of set up a super fund for things like uh, rising sea level and so on. So here's how it was supposed to work. All over, let's say, Europe, there would be all these countries that were burning lots of fossil fuels for coal-fired pow power and every, a car in every garage and so on. And all these countries had a quota to meet, and they're not going to be able to make that quota on any given year. The reality is, at least at first under the Kyoto Protocol, it would be really hard for Germany and Italy and France and so on to actually meet those goals. On the other hand, there were these undeveloped countries like Angola or Congo or Cameroon or whatever who would have permission to burn some fossil fuels and they weren't even burning as much as they had permission to burn. And these countries could sell that permission to the richer countries who aren't making their quotas. So if Germany is 100 million tons of carbon over their quota, they could go to Angola who was a million tons, you know, 100 million tons under their quota, and say, hey, what's it going to cost us? What can we do to buy that permission off of you? And you know what? As long as Angola is willing to sell it for less than the cost of those economic penalties, it's a win-win situation, right? The uh, Germany's spending less to buy that permission, and Angola's getting cash, which hypothetically they're supposed to use for things like green power in practice. I'm not sure how often that happens. But you can see how this was going to work. The undeveloped countries like Angola, Cameroon, Nicaragua, Honduras, Belize, whatever, Ecuador, would be highly incentivized to not start burning fossil fuels in any great quantity because they're getting cash. They get to have the rich countries of the world come, you know, the ambassador shows up or whatever, and says, what's it going to cost us? And the developed countries would be highly incentivized to cut back on their burning of fossil fuels because they don't want to do this. They don't want to pay the penalties or go off to uh, talk to Libya, uh, South Africa, wherever, and ask, what's it going to cost us? So see how this is a huge idea. It's a great idea. This sort of market-based strategy is a great way to, to phase out something you don't like. In practice, this is how things like leaded gasoline got phased out too. It's part actually of how the Kyoto Protocol worked as well. This should have worked. And if it had all worked right and the, everybody had signed on and everybody had made it work, the Kyoto Protocol was supposed to reduce carbon dioxide emissions by about 5% by the year 2012. Okay, first off, is that enough? 
is this going to have saved the world? Like, for example, if we have less 5% less carbon dioxide emission, will we have solved global warming? Not even close. And it, it's not anywhere near enough. Um, but it's a start. And you know what? Once the market strategy works, maybe we can change the quotas and even make it work better or something. But here's the deal. Part of what needed to make it happen was for everybody to sign on. And as you probably know, the United States did not sign on. And in that regard, we were, what, one of like four countries that didn't. I think us, North Korea, Iraq. I can't remember who else. Yeah, it wasn't a great company to be in. But the revised version of the Kyoto Protocol that worked without the United States' participation should have reduced carbon dioxide by emissions. Not, not change the amount of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere, just change the amount at which we are adding it to the Earth's atmosphere. Okay, well, it's a start, but it would still only be 1.2% that we were actually reducing it by 2012. You know, if you aren't enthusiastic about that, I can't blame you. That's just not that much of a reduction in carbon. But you know what? It's a reduction. It's not increasing the amount being added each year. We're still putting more carbon dioxide, but at least we're starting to test an idea of how to reduce how much we emit. Okay, not necessarily a terrible idea. And how did it work out? Well, here's a graph uh, of world carbon dioxide emissions over the first, you know, since 1990. And you can see that, in fact, it's gone up not down. Now, a person could blame the United States for not having signed the treaty, but you'll notice our emissions, which are in the red line there, are uh, actually pretty flat. We haven't actually increased uh, in our emissions all that much. Really, the tracking, if you look at the slope of the line there, it's almost entirely China. Okay, China has increased their rate at which they are emitting carbon dioxide so much faster than anybody could have predicted. The overall effect has been to, uh, to, to have greater emissions, not less. The rate at which carbon dioxide is increasing the atmosphere has actually gone up. Despite the billions that has been spent in Japan and England and France and Germany and Sweden and so on to buy back cars that were big polluters and to pay uh, homeowners to put more uh, efficient insulation in their homes and put in more efficient hot water heaters and so on. Despite all that, something went wrong. Well, fundamentally, what went wrong is two things. One, great alternatives to the burning of fossil fuels didn't really materialize. Um, part of the reason why the Montreal Protocol works so well at phasing out chlorofluorocarbons is Dow Chemical and DuPont Chemical and so on. They all had great alternatives already on the market for the chlorofluorocarbons. We just had to switch. There aren't great alternatives for the burning of fossil fuels. I mean, fossil fuels work because they're cheap and they produce a lot of energy. Um, you know, it takes a long time to build new nuclear power plants that wouldn't, I mean, you can like or dislike nuclear power, but it certainly is green. Um, you can produce some of your power from wind and solar and things like that, but it's hard to scale that up in a cost-effective way. Um, everybody, when they were negotiating the Kyoto Pro, was thinking by now we'd have great alternatives on the market, and we just don't. Also, China, India, and Indonesia, they just grew so much faster than the predictions of uh, the people who negotiated the Kyoto Protocol. They had no idea uh, that the economy of those places would grow as fast as it has. And that's a real problem. I mean, as car ownership is increasing in those places and, I mean, you know, the, you know, the homes burn more, uh, use consume more electricity because of computers and refrigerators and air conditioners, this is a problem. Okay, we, well, you know, it's also a wonderful thing. We've lifted billions of people out of poverty. On the other hand, they are also becoming more like us. Um, so was, Kyoto Protocol, was the Kyoto Protocol a flawed treaty? Well, yes and no. I mean, it had really good ideas behind it, it but this business of it not applying to everyone and letting China, India, and Indonesia off the hook... Um, probably wasn't such a good idea in retrospect. The, the goals, there should have been a way back in 1995 or 1996 when they were negotiating this thing to find something those countries could do. It's a bad thing that all, over the last 20 years, China has built so many coal-fired power plants and India has built so many coal. Now what are we going to do with all that? Um, at least, uh, true, in, the, in Europe and so on, fuel prices are so much higher because of the Kyoto Protocol. One of the ways in which countries like Germany, Poland, Italy, so on, have encouraged people to use less fossil fuel and more often take public transportation is they just put very high taxes on fuel. And so, you know, you often hear that, like, gasoline costs something like $10 a gallon in Germany and so on. Well, they, that's part of how 
they encourage people to burn less of it. It makes sense. On the other hand, you know, um, poor people have to drive too. Uh, you know, if you're a poor person in Germany and you got to drive to work, it sucks the gas is like $10 a gallon, right? Okay. So, you know, you end up taking three different buses and it takes an hour to get home from work and all this kind of stuff. I mean, that's a, that's a problem. There was no credit for efficiency in this uh, treaty. Um, the United States can make squeaky dog toys for much less in terms of carbon dioxide emissions than China can. Okay, our, our factories are more efficient. You just don't have to haul the squeaky toys as far to a Walmart in America. I mean, can you imagine every squeaky dog toy that China builds has to be shipped in a carton on a container ship across the ocean by a big diesel-powered freighter? I mean, how can we haul these things halfway around the planet, right? Well, the answer is it's because the labor is so cheap in China. Okay, we can afford to, in terms of money, but that doesn't mean it's a good idea with regard to carbon dioxide emissions. There should have been, when they negotiated the Kyoto Protocol, some way of having credit for efficiency. If you're producing something close to where it's being consumed, or you can produce something for far less emissions of greenhouse gases than this place does, there should have been some way to level the playing field on things like that and get, um, get economic credits to encourage people to buy things that were built near where they live. That makes sense. Um, it's a good point, too, that all this business of the Kyoto Protocol was negotiated and all this system was set up, and in the end, it was only designed even to reduce carbon dioxide emissions by a basically negligible amount. I mean, if they're going to set all this up, why didn't they set the goals higher anyway? Um, the penalty scheme was pretty expensive. Um, a lot of money ended up in, uh, you know, the hands of countries we don't particularly like or with governments we don't particularly like. Um, this was maybe a bit of a flawed treaty. And so... For quite a few years, we've been working on figuring out how to replace it. And the most recent attempt to replace it is happened in November of, 19, I'm sorry, of 2015 in Paris. The governments of the world met there for about a three-week-long summit of negotiating some solution. And the resulting uh, proposed treaty is called the Paris Agreement. And the Paris Agreement is a complicated document that is fresh enough off the presses that it's still being litigated as to what it all and analyzed as to what it all means for everybody. I can't give you a final answer of exactly how the Paris Agreement is going to work better, but the headline of the Paris Agreement is that it discusses global warming in terms of the amount of temperature change, and it sets an extremely ambitious goal of only allowing the temperature of the planet to warm by 2 degrees Celsius over the pre-industrial average. This is a very ambitious goal. We're already at about 1.2 degrees above pre-industrial temperatures, uh, so we're already more than halfway there to that goal. And uh, survivors of ATS-105 might remember there's such a thing as committed warming, warming that's coming whether even if we stopped emitting carbon dioxide now. And the committed warming actually gets us almost all the way to 2 degrees. Basically, the Paris Agreement to come into full force is going to require some pretty big steps pretty darn fast. Um, it, there's no doubt about it, the Paris Agreement has much stronger uh, limitations on what China, India, and Indonesia can do, and they have agreed to those things. Okay, that will certainly help. I mean, there's, you know, more than a billion people in China, and there's more than a billion people in India, and if we can start finding ways to make those places greener, maybe we actually have something there. One interesting thing about the Paris agreement is that it requires the countries of the world to uh, meet again every five years to make adjustments to the treaty based on what's working and what doesn't. It's built into the system that once you're a signatory of it, there's sort of a feedback as to how it works. Um, unlike Kyoto, a kind of a problem that seems to be emerging from the Paris Agreement is that the countries of the world set their own goals. Um, how exactly that's going to work and how that's going to work with different governments, with different agendas and so on, remains very much to be seen. But um, the governments of the world are responsible in a variety of financial ways and so on to meet the goals once they set them. At the present time, too, again, that was sort of left for later conventions and so on, the Paris Agreement doesn't actually set up much of anything of an enforcement mechanism. It's awfully hard to get the countries of the world to agree as to how other countries are going to force them to enforce their rules. 
This is again a potential problem for the Paris Agreement. We certainly like the idea that they have made a very ambitious way of trying to regulate how much the planet is going to warm, uh, but it remains to be seen in some cases exactly how that's all going to actually work. But that's okay, I mean, it's certainly a step in the right direction. Kyoto Protocol wasn't really working all that well anyway. Let's see if we can figure something else out. Okay, so what we learned in this part two, uh, or lecture two of the heat lecture, was all about what controlled short wave down and what controlled long wave down. The short wave down stuff was about sun angles, length of daylight, solar declination, the use of an analemma, and so on. The long wave down was about greenhouse gases in the Earth's atmosphere. Uh, the, the greenhouse effect, the enhanced greenhouse effect, climate change, the Kyoto Protocol, the Paris Agreement, and so on. All of which is very instrumental in determining the temperature both over the course of a day or from one t season to another, but also in terms of like long-term climate changes. All right, before we wrap up this very long lecture, let's do two more quick questions. Question nine. The Kyoto Protocol established limits for how much carbon dioxide different countries could emit. For the undeveloped countries, these limits were A, more than they were already emitting, B, less than what they were already emitting, C, waived, we, we waived those limits, or D, zero. They, their limit was to burn no, no, have no carbon dioxide emissions whatsoever. Which of those is what the Kyoto Protocol tried to do? Make a choice from those four options and get a little feedback before you move on to the final question.